What does it mean to Jersey music? I think for a lot of fans of music in New Jersey, Maxwell's was the center of the universe. Maxwell's was an absolutely pop culture, had a pop culture moment. A lot of people felt like Maxwell's was their place. And, you know, the famous scene in Cheers is when Norm walks in and the entire bar looks up and goes, Hi, Norm! And that's kind of what Maxwell's felt like. But I guess, you know, even when we're closing, the legacy's still going to continue to be written. January of 1977. I was looking for a place to stay and he recommended Hoboken. I had never really heard of it except in reference to Frank Sinatra. Well, we, whenever we got to Maxwell's, it was never open. So we finally said to the owner, like, why didn't you ever open? So they would only be open an hour in between each break of the Maxwell House plant. So it was basically a ball and beer joint. Coming out of the PATH train into uh, that small town that was like a time warp, it was like walking into, I would imagine, the 1950s. You know, it hadn't really changed much for the previous decades. Well, we were all kids, you know, we were like 21 going in there, but it was just like, almost like it was a blank canvas or something we could just, that we could imagine starting something. 1978 was, uh, July 1978 was when Max was opened up. Literally, we didn't have the hinges on the, on the front door. When the, like at 6 o'clock, when it came time to open the door, there were people just walking over us trying to get into the place. That's, you know, how, how successful. The, like the first, I mean, we were pretty lucky that the first day we opened, we were packed, you know, and then it was just packed from then on because it was just such an obviously needed thing in that area. You know, I wonder if it was just sort of we showed up and they said, oh, let's, okay, we have a real band. Let's, let's put them on, you know, let's have a show. It might have been very, almost spontaneous. And we were off, and, we, and all these glasses vibrated off the shelf, <laughs> and all the, it smashed, like with, you know, when, when, the, when the, we started rocking. <laughs> Glenn was, Glenn and Abe Man were definitely, you know, the pioneers of that day for Hoboken, you know, so as far as, as them being, you know, one of the first bands to ever move into the town and kind of take advantage of its, of its pluses. I can't think of a better way to end the club than, how, than the way it started because there was a purity of intent with that first show. It was like boys wanting to play songs for people. I, I, you know, like I say, I was grateful to be the first guy through the door all those years ago and, you know, I'm grateful to, to be the last guy going out when I, when I, when, you know, I saw Todd and I said, is it really true what you're saying about Maxwell's closing? And, I said, yeah, I said, well, you should get uh, A, you know. <laughs> I should try to reform A, and we'll be the last band to play. We were the first band. And he, was, he liked that idea and, you know, ran with it. But when you look about the life cycles of rock clubs, even ones that you think about as institutions, you know, they don't last forever. They're not there forever, and that's part of it. It just seemed like the... Uh, the, the timing was right. I was just getting, uh, feeling that it was just too difficult for me to continue operating in town. It starts to be one of these things where, it, here, here's the best way to put it. It used to be, you would talk to people from out of town and they would say, oh, Maxwell's, that's the best place to play. In the past maybe four or five years, it's been, oh, Maxwell's, that's the best place to play, but. And also, uh, feeling that the future was likely to not be favorable to us given all these scenarios and not, not wanting to run it into the ground. You don't have the same, so a combination, you don't have that same local base to draw from of bands in Hoboken, people in bands in Hoboken, the type of people who go to check out an independent band. And it's harder to get people from outside of Hoboken to the clubs. I, I told someone the other way this is going to be like, uh, you know, the other week, because it was still in mid-June, I think this is going to be like a six-week-long New Orleans jazz funeral. We keep doing it, we keep doing it, we keep doing it. 
doing it. For Christ's sake, Todd, tell us this is the last time. I worked for a magazine called New York Rocker. I knew the New York bands. When A broke up, I actually started booking the place. I booked like about six weeks of bands, including the Flesh Tones, the Necessaries, Come On, Nervous Rex, the DBs, uh, a couple other bands. And Steve would give me like a, a free meal a week for, to do the booking. We used to, we used to like really just uh, have these shows here that were like ceremonies. And I remember some writer in, I think, in uh, the Village Voice or so, one of these papers said that her idea of a great Flesh Tones show was like going to Maxwell's and then waking up on somebody else's lawn the next morning. And I said, That's, that is the right thing. So you had this genesis of a scene happening. Musicians who hung out there, were playing in the back room, getting to know each other. Their friends would go. And slowly Maxwell's uh, earned a reputation. And eventually, much to our excitement, the Feelys showed up, which we were all Feelys fans. And the Feelys were the first kind of, you know, suburban kids that had kind of made it, you know, like. And, and their first single raised eyebrows. And we play that single endlessly. It's almost like, well, if you build it, they will come next thing we know, you know, the feelies start showing up and hanging out. If you eat in the front room or even hang out there by the bar, the fans are right there, so you have a tendency to talk to the fans, and it's just a lot more intimate. And that kind of, I think, follows through into the back room. There's a feeling of uh, community, I guess, with the fans that you really don't get in a lot of places. But the sound that they generated seemed to go so perfectly with the room. And the way Hoboken felt at that time. It seemed like there were secrets in Hoboken, and it seemed like there were secrets hidden in the Feelys music. And when you went to Maxwell's, you kind of got in touch with all of that stuff. That's what you felt at one of their concerts. It felt private. It felt like something that, that the world was holding back a little. I think of the Feelies as the ultimate Maxwell's band. When A broke up, the rest of the guys continued as the bongos. So they were up and running immediately, and I had to, you know, had to spend some time, like, putting a new band together, a new lineup together. Whenever we played anywhere, well, number one, we would always say we're the bongos from Hoboken. We made it clear that we were not from Manhattan, we were from Hoboken. The way a band now would be from Williamsburg. We were the first to kind of get around the country and the world pretty fast. Within a year we were playing in England and we got signed to a British label called Fetish Records. We were signed out of, we were at Maxwell's, he saw a show, the, the uh, head of the label, and signed us right there at the club. We signed the contracts in the front room over dinner at Maxwell's. Immediately, it was one thing after another. The Bongos got on this momentum that was quite intense because we had a, a, uh, a heavy recording schedule and then we would tour. We eventually were touring, touring 300 shows a year. And not to equate it to another band, but you know, in our minds, let me put it this way. In our minds, it was our Liverpool. Now, I'm saying, I'm qualifying that by saying in our minds because I don't want anyone to perceive this as thinking that we were like the Beatles. But I will say that um, it was like our, this little port town by next, to, you know, that was not really the biggest city, but kind of had a great vibe, and it was our Liverpool, and we would promote it that way around the world. You know, it was one part fantasy, one part reality. You know, we were kind of living the dream, and it, and it was very dreamlike, I think, in, in many ways. The New York Times really got behind it first. I remember there was a crazy thing was like home of Glenn Morrow and Frank Sinatra. You know, I was like, what? And then eventually that sort of congealed enough that writers started writing about it and uh, you know they're all, all it became a, the Hoboken sound does it really exist then in 86 of course Bruce Springsteen filled the uh, film his glory days video there which was kind of, you know it, I think that was people talk about that as being a big moment for Maxwell's I think it was a big moment for Bruce Springsteen kind of cashing in on uh, 
on Maxwell's cred. And that it really wasn't supposed to be Maxwell's. It was supposed to be the strip club in Secaucus, but their ceilings were too low. REM had nothing but a 7-inch with Radio Free Europe on it, on a little tiny label out of Athens. And yet the first time they came to play Maxwell's, it was completely sold out. We did become like the, like the, 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 the um, I guess, the, um, what do you call them? The media's darlings, in a way. I mean, MTV did stuff from there. Greg Kinn did stuff from there. Martha Quinn, you know, did stuff from there. Nirvana came on the Bleach tour before anybody knew who they were. For some bizarre reason, Soundgarden played there, pulled up with a truck full of equipment like they were playing an arena, and looked at the size of the room and said, well, we have to rethink this a little bit. And that was so crazy, Chris Cornell actually took a mic stand, and he got so carried away, he put it right through the ceiling. There was a big hole in the ceiling for for years afterwards. It just, it, it just never stopped. You know, actually, I'll tell you, here's, here's the best way to explain it. That when I finally stopped, like, doing Maxwell's completely, when I just said, okay, I sold it and I got out, and I, was, I had the fortune of being on the beach with Peter Buck and my friends, and we were walking down the street, and I was laughing, and he said, what are you laughing at? I said, I am watching a movie backwards. And it's because that I just never really, it never, it never ever, ever, and never, never had a time where I could actually, there was actually a breathing time. I mean, I lived upstairs. I mean, there was times when I didn't leave that building for two whole months. Part of the, the Hoboken scene that came out of, that emanated out of Maxwell's, made that secret nationally known. So it had a good side. It was really fun. It was a fun, that was a fun ride to be on that. But it was also the um, detriment to the city was that it started losing, it slowly started losing its initial charm, which was its, the idiosyncratic kind of, uh, time warp vibe that I was describing before. Well, there was a lot of things involved. There was a lot going on. There was, there was, you know, the taxes were rising in, 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 um, in, in Hoboken. You know, there, there was, there were, the scene was changing quite drastically. I think when Corn played Maxwell's, I think that might have did it for me. You know, I might have said to Todd, you know, I said, this is the reason why I left, why I opened my club, was so that, you know, I wouldn't have to see bands like this. So I, I just decided that, you know, it was, I needed to make that break. And I think that, I, I, I didn't see it going up at that point in time, so I, I felt that I had to leave at the top of the, of, of the thing, or, or on the crest on the, of the downward spiral. There was a big brew tank in the window. And while the bookings weren't terrible, it just didn't have the, the same feeling. And it felt like everybody was just holding their breath. And there were questions at that time, is the Hoboken scene over? But then when Todd and his partners, Dave Post from Swingadelic and Steve Shelley from the band Sonic Youth, bought Maxwell's and brought it back, it was like everybody exhaled. And it picked up right where it left off. And that was the incredible thing about it. It was like the brew pub never happened. Well, there's going to be a great big party at my place. And I, 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 that's the whole I'm charging $10 to get into my place. But, you know, Todd really, like, learned how to book from Steve. And I, I you know... What I like that Todd did, like, he never turned it into a nostalgia place. Like, he didn't put pictures of Bruce Springsteen and Nirvana on the walls, you know. Like, he kept it. It's like, no, this is about current music or music that we, we like or, you know, rock and roll, original rock and roll. And uh, so, yeah, maybe you call it chapter two, but it was, it's all the same book. I first became aware of Maxwell's, knowing that it existed, in the year 2000. I was 16 years old. This is fun. We're doing this little thing at this legendary space. Soon, not long for this earth. One end of the spectrum was the concerts me and my friends did in our own little stupid bands in high school playing in mom's basement or the, or the school cafeteria or something. And the other end of the spectrum was like Bob Dylan and The Who and bands like that at like Madison Square Garden. And I didn't think that there was a world between that. I thought that I had hit my ceiling as a musician. I knew I wasn't ever going to play at Madison Square Garden. You know, 
it's like an empowering thing. It's like to be, get on stage at Maxwell's where Sonic Youth and the replacements and everybody you ever heard of once stood, like where f Bruce Springsteen stood to make the Glory Days video. Like you feel like you're you know, connected to something much bigger and more important than yourself. And it's all, and it's, but it's a part of you, like it's New Jersey. I, I think, I think the, the greatest uh, tragedy about losing Maxwell's is, is that it's kind of like a, a really big loss for our state, or the arts and culture in our state, because there's not really another venue that has like the reputation and the history that Maxwell's has. Um, kicking around New Jersey. So like when, when uh, a local New Jersey band wants to play in their home state, like where the hell are they gonna go? It's just, there's, there's nowhere really to play. What you're seeing now is a lot of young married couples, a lot of baby strollers, a lot of pet stores in town. Everybody has a dog or a cat. Uh, a lot of baby stores. Uh, and uh, you go to Maxwell's now on a Saturday That's afternoon, like it's all parents bringing their kids in there for lunch and dinner. And the other main reason, and this is a huge thing, and, uh, and it sounds like a small thing, but it's actually gigantic if you're a touring band, is that parking in that part of town, because of the condominium development, is impossible. I mean, you just can't park in Hoboken anymore. You know, I played with the Feelies the other night, and I raced home, parked on the street, ran up, dropped off my guitar, came back downstairs, and I had a ticket, so. That was after, you know, kind of getting tired of hearing Todd talking about the parking, and then I got a ticket, so. The town has really gotten so big for its size. It's only 14 blocks, it's only a mile square. They used to call it the Miracle Mile. Now it really is a miracle that it's contained in a mile. I, I guess that's what the city wanted, and that's what they, like, geared their neighborhood up, up for, is, uh, you know, really expensive martini bars and, like, sports bars with, like, 18 you know, 62-inch plasma screen TVs all playing ESPN. It's like, if that's what they want, that's what they got. And they ousted out like a venue that had great cultural importance. And so they can put a Starbucks there or whatever. <laughs>very proud of what uh, I'm not so naive that I didn't think that it was going to be it, the story was not going to resonate with people but the the level that it has is it's like wow and you went there and you felt like you belonged in a way that you just didn't feel like you belonged in your hometown I never wanted to step foot on the stage until I actually played at Maxwell's. And so the first time I, I did it, and I turned around, and I looked out at the audience and the light was in my eyes, it's something that I'm never gonna, for, never gonna forget. You do feel like this is the room in which I grew up. This is where I, I came to musical consciousness. I'm the kind of person who believes that history is made by being in the right place at the right time. So the Fallons came along and bought Maxwell's at just the right time. Glenn Morrow and Richard Barone wandered in there and said, hey, can our band play here? Just the right time. Uh, it, it, it's almost as if it was, you know, it was meant to be that way. As if, if you, I don't really believe in fate, but it almost seems like, like that, that's, that's how it happened. And I'm so lucky I was there and, and got to live through it all. You know, in an odd way, in an odd way it's freeing for, for me too, because it's like, it, w it will close a certain chapter in my life, and, and then it's like, well, all right, now what? You know, certain cities at different times have these indie pop explosions. Maybe it's time for North Jersey again. Maybe this will help start something new. You don't know, you know? It takes that someone walking into the venue. It takes that, you know, Glen Morrow and, and happy, you know, this new place opening. It takes just the right combination of chemistries to make something like catch fire.